Okay. Hello, class, uh, and hi to all those who have joined in live and to all those who will be, you know, watching this lecture le later. So today uh, we will be starting the functional materials module for your uh, advanced materials chemistry course. And in this, I will be taking five lectures for you on this energy materials, and uh, then it will be followed by magnetic materials, and then it will be uh, followed by materials for catalysis. So the first two lectures will cover energy materials where today's lecture particularly we will be talking mostly about electrochemistry and batteries followed by the next lecture which will be on Thursday and uh, it will be a remaining of batteries and a little bit of the supercapacitor part. So overview of the content so first we will be covering a little bit of basic electrochemistry then batteries what are primary batteries what are secondary batteries. Then we will discuss about energy density and power density. These are the two very common terms which you'll hear in energy storage materials. So what are they and how they are kind of related to each other. Then we will talk mostly about, you know, the workhorse and battery, which is lithium ion battery components and processes which are used in lithium ion battery technology. And we will cover a little bit about cathode materials for lithium ion battery. So before we actually start into the basic electrochemistry, because many of you are coming in from different backgrounds. So let's start a little bit on the history part. So the story of this electrochemistry, it begins with Alexander Volta and he announced the invention of voltaic pile, which was the first modern electrical battery. And that was way back in the 1800. So what was this actually voltaic pile? You have two metals and these uh, metals were used to build the pile and which were zinc and copper. So you have this alternating disks of these opposing metals and between the disks what you have paste is a pasteboard or a cloth which was dampened with a solution of salt and water or brine or vinegar. And then the electrochemical reaction in each of these three units of the pile it formed an electric cell and it generated a current. So therefore when you are changing the number of the units Volta could actually increase or decrease the amount of electricity which was produced. So this was the first example of you know, electrochemistry. So William, William Nichols Time, which was by Gaston Plant in 1859. He first uh, demonstrated the use of alternating current to drive an induction motor. Then of course the Nernst equation and Arrhenius equation which is the dependence of reaction rates on temperature and general interpretation of dynamics of electrochemical process. This was uh, formulated by them in 1889. Then you had Cottrell who came up with the famous Cottrell equation which rules the relation between electrode kinetics and mass transport by diffusion in 1903. And in 1914, Thomas Edison, he actually worked on the nickel and iron battery. So these are kind of the landmark achievements which had happened in this field of electrochemistry. So what is electrochemistry? I'm sure that all of you have heard about it, read about it in your plus two, in your bachelor's, in your master's. But here we will just give a little bit of rehash of what you had already learned. So electrochemistry is a discipline that deals with chemical reactions 
and it involves an exchange of electric charges between two substances. So chemical change is leading to an electric current or when you're passing electric current, it is leaving rise to a chemical change. So vice versa, this process. So this is nothing. This encompasses the entire branch of chemistry, which is known as electrochemistry, a very simplistic way of describing this very, very, uh, I would say a very, very uh, involved subject. Electrochemistry, so is a study of reactions in which charged particles, ions or electrons, they cross the interface between two phases of matter, typically a metallic phase, which is the electrode, and a conductive solution, which is the electrolyte. So in the reduction, what is happening? The oxidant to which electron is added, you get the product, you call this as reduction. In oxidation, it is the other way around. So you have a product and with the release of electrons. So electron lost, oxidation number increases, and you say that that, is, that process is nothing but oxidation. So a few basic concepts. One is the electroneutrality principle. What does the electro, electro, electroneutrality principle state? That bulk matter cannot have a chemically significant imbalance of positive and negative ions. So suppose you continue to dissolve a particular metal, metal in solution. So will it proceed indefinitely? No. So what is going to happen? It will only proceed to a measurable extent only if there is some means to remove that excess negative charge which is being developed in that particular solution. So either for this, you have to add an electron acceptor ions in the solution, or you have to draw the electrons out of the metal through an external circuit. So only then that dissolution is going to happen. And that is because of the electroneutrality principle. Other important point is the interface, interfacial potential. So these exist in all the phase boundaries. So in case of a metal in contact with an electrolyte solution, this interfacial region, it will consist of an electric double layer. And the potential difference between a metal and the solution is almost entirely located across a very thin double layer and it leads to extremely large potential gradients in this particular region. So how do we uh, depict it pictori uh, pictorially? So this is what is shown over here, the electrode potential. So if you see on the left hand side, I have marked two particular electrodes, one is A and the other is B. So one of them is an active one, the other is the less active metal electrode. So you have an electric double layer, which is the phi zero layer, which you can see over there. And this is the surface potential. Phi D is basically the stern potential, whereas phi X is the potential, which is at a distance X from the surface. And the first is known as the dense part of the Helmholtz or the stern layer. And part two is nothing but the diffuse part of this electric double layer. So as the distance, as you can see from the surface to the electrode is increasing, what is happening? The concentration of cations and anions is decreasing. And ultimately, it is becoming equal to the concentration in solution. So as a result, what is happening is that an electrical double layer or the EDL is getting formed. So when the EDL is getting formed, the potential difference between the electrode surface, which is which was phi zero and the solution at a distance x from the electrode surface, which is phi x, this we call it as the electrode potential. So E is nothing but phi zero minus phi x. So please keep this in mind. So moving on. What we talked about is a voltaic cell. First, what we had is a voltaic cell. What is a voltaic cell? The motion of electrons in ionic bonding can be used to generate an electric current. And a device which is constructed to do this is known as a voltaic cell. So you have two electrodes made of two different materials, both of which are chemical, both of which chemically react with the electrolyte in some form of ionic bonding. So this is basically the idea of a voltaic cell. So we also call this as a galvanic cell and this you have seen in umpteen number of textbooks. So you have a zinc anode, you have a copper cathode. So basically zinc is going into the solution as zinc ion, whereas copper is getting deposited on the copper electrode. And so what you have over here is the flow of electrons which is moving from the anode to the cathode. So you can see in this diagram over here, zinc anode and the copper cathode. You can see the zinc anode is depleting and in the copper cathode you see a deposition of the copper. This is because of the flow of electrons from the anode to the cathode and the deposition of copper on your copper cathode where the reduction is taking place. Sorry. This is not working. This one? Yeah. So now we will discuss, sorry for the little bit of interruption over here at, at our end. So here now we will talk a little bit about the cell potential. So what is the cell potential? 
Cell potential is nothing but it's a measure of how well a cell reaction it can push or push or pull the electrons through a circuit. So the electrical energy generated by the spontaneous reaction is proportional to the cell potential. So how do you uh, define the standard cell potential? This cell potential is measured when all the species are in their standard state. And this is given by E0 cell is E0 cathode minus cell potential of the anode. Now one thing which you have to remember is this value of the electrode potential, it depends on many things. It is not an absolute thing. So it depends on many things. What are those things you have? It depends on the material for which you uh, the material which are using to make the electrodes. It also depends on the nature of the solvent. It also depends on the temperature, the concentration of the uh, electrode ex uh, when it is exchanging the ions. So therefore, the electrode potential, you cannot have an absolute value. You need to have a reference electrode on the basis of which or compared to which you are actually measuring this particular electrode potential. So that is one part. And the other is basically the change in the Gibbs free energy. So change in the Gibbs free energy or del Z0 is given by minus N F E0 of the cell where n is the number of moles of electrons, f is your Faraday constant, and E0 cell is the standard electrode potential. So these are the basic concepts which you need to refresh. Now one more concept is the standard hydrogen electrode. So this is a reference electrode. Most of the electrode potentials are generally reference to it. And how you are making the standard hydrogen electrode? When the hydrogen gas is absorbed at one atmosphere pressure over a platinum electrode which is dipped at 25 degrees centigrade in one molar HCl, it is a regular electrode of hydrogen and its potential is nothing but zero volt. And most of the other electrodes are uh, give the electrode potential values are given with respect to the standard hydrogen electrode. So as you can see over here, I've given a table later on when you go through the slides, you will be able to see that more negative the reduction potential is, then more readily the element acts as a reduce, reducing agent. So it itself is getting oxidized. So this is by having the this uh, this particular table in front of you, you should be able to tell that which is going to get oxidized, which of the elements is going to get oxidized and which is going to get reduced when they are placed in contact with each other. Now coming to Nernst equation, most famous equation which gives you the relation between Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant. So del G0 is nothing but minus RT ln K and this K is the equilibrium constant. So delta G for a reaction, it will depend on the concentration and how it is going to depend where delta G is nothing but delta G0 plus RT ln Q and Q is nothing but the reaction quotient. So basically it is the concentration of the product divided by the concentration of the reactant. But when you want to say about E cell and you want to compare it with the E0 cell, then if you use the delta G values, you will be able to do that. Delta G is minus NF E cell and delta G0 is minus NF E0 cell. So if you are doing that entire jargon, you will find that E cell is nothing but E0 cell minus RT by NF ln Q and this is nothing but the Nernst equation. So the Nernst equation is giving you the relationship between Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant. And it is also telling you how the delta G of a reaction is depending on the concentration. So now coming to electrolytic cells, Daniel cells or the galvanic cells, they were, they were, they were spontaneous. But non-spontaneous reaction also occurs in this electrolytic cells. So the electrolysis reaction it will require and in this particular case the electrolysis reaction will require electrical energy to induce the reaction. And here I have given you an example of molten sodium chloride which is electrolyzed to give you liquid sodium and chlorine gas. So the entire concept is reversing the direction of the spontaneous reaction which occurs in a galvanic cell by the input of electricity. And this is nothing, this is basically the heart of what the concept which is known as electrolysis. So though the direction of the electron flow in the electrolytic cells may be reversed from the direction of the spontaneous electron flow in galvanic cells, the definition of cathode and anode remains the same. So reduction will take place at the cathode and oxidation is going to take place at the anode. The definition doesn't change. But how you are putting in, how you are charging through the current that, and how the reaction, which way it is going, it differs. And that is how basically the Daniel cell, it differs from an electrolytic cell. So if you compare between a galvanic cell or a Daniel cell with a electrolytic cell, so the difference what occurs is in the cell potential. In one case, as you know, it's a spontaneous reaction. So delta G has to be negative. So your E value, as you can see in this particular case, when you're having a reaction between iron and copper, in that case, you can see the E0 value is positive. So your delta G is negative because it is a spontaneous reaction. 
In the electrolytic cell, it is moving, the reaction is going to move the other way. And in this particular case, you see your E0 cell is negative. So copper is spontaneously plated onto the copper cathode in case of a galvanic cell, whereas it will require a voltage which is greater than 0.78 volt from the battery to plate iron on its cathode on the electrolytic cell. So these are the basic differences. Now coming to another very important concept, which is Faraday's law. So the amount of substance which is consumed or produced at one of the electrodes in an electrolytic cell, this is directly proportional to the amount of electricity which is passing through the cell. So if one coulomb of charge is transferred when one ampere current flows for one second, so that, that, that is basically the definition of coulomb. So when you have one ampere current which is flowing through one, but one second, so W is MIT by NF, where W is the mass of the substance which is deposited, M is the molecular weight of the substance, I is the current you're passing through it, time, T is the time for which that current is passed, which is generally given in seconds, N is the number of electrons transferred, and F is your Faraday constant. So the amount of chemical change is proportional to the amount of current passed. So there are different variables in electrochemical cell. When we talk about an electrochemical cell, we have to kind of fix each and every parameter. So now let's have an idea about what are the different variables which are there in an electrochemical cell. So in the electrochemical cell, you will have the electrode variables are the material, then you have the surface area, you have the geometry, and you also have the surface condition. Then there are various mass transfer variables. So what are the mass transfer variables? You have the mode, which can be diffusion or convection. You can have the surface concentration and the adsorption. So these are the different mass transfer variables. You have also a lot of solution variables. So what are the solution variables? You have bulk concentration of electroactive species. You can have concentration of other species, the solvent. So these are all the variables from the material side, from the movement side, and from the solvent side or the solution variables. Then in the electrical variables, the potential can vary, the current can vary, and the quantity of electricity also can vary. Whereas in the external variables, you have the temperature, you have pressure and time. So you can imagine the number of variables you have to play with when you are actually uh, doing electrochemistry. So now let's look into what are the different regions and where all these reactions are taking place. So what we have is basically the electrode, as you can see over here, the electrode is this particular plate. And on top of it, you have the electron transfer, which is happening, the adsorption, desorption is happening. You have all these chemical reactions, which are all happening in the electrode surface region. So you have the chemical reaction, you have adsorption, desorption, you have all this electron transfer, all this is happening near the electrode. Whereas in the bulk solution, what you have is this mass transfer. So the mass transfer is happening in the bulk solution region. So all these different regions, you have this concentration gradient getting developed. And so basically this is going to affect, you know, what you consider to be the ideal cell performance. So you will have many variables which will make your cell behave a little bit differently than it would have behaved in an ideal circumstance. And one of the most important points which you should uh, understand in electrochemistry is the concept of overpotential. So what is overpotential? So this is the extra potential which you must apply to an electrode to initiate the electrode reaction in an electrochemical cell. So we know that there is some E involved for you to make that react reaction happen. But most of the time you will find that if you are putting in that potential, the reaction doesn't occur. You have to add a little bit extra. So that extra is nothing but that over potential. So what is it? The difference between the equilibrium potential and the applied potential required to initiate the electrode reaction. So this is known as the overpotential. So delta E is nothing but Ej minus E. So this cell overpotential has different independent contributors contributing to this overpotential, this extra potential which is needed to force the reaction to happen or the electrode reaction to happen. So out of this three most important are the ohmic drop, the activation overpotential and the diffusion overpotential. So what is this ohmic drop? So ohmic drop between electrodes, it results from the fact that the electrolyte solution, it has a finite conductivity. So this electrolyte solution, you remember, it, it will have something which is known as it doesn't have an infinite conductivity, it has some resistance, it has a finite conductivity. So this ohmic drop will always occur between the working electrode and the reference electrode. And this contribution to polarization will be equal to IR. So I is the current density and R is the resistance and resistance is all that of the electrolyte solution. The second contribution to overpotential is from the activation overpotential. 
So activation of a potential at one or both electrodes, they arise from kinetic inhibition of one of the steps which are involved in the electrode reaction. So electrode reaction, as I showed you, has many steps. Desolvation of the reactive ion, chemisorption of the reaction product, and there were so many others I showed you in the electrode surface region. So this activation potential can happen because there is a kinetic inhibition to any of these steps or maybe one or more of the steps. So activation polarization, this is generally caused by a very slow electrode reaction. The reaction at the electrode, it will require an activation energy in order to proceed. So this is the activation over potential. Then you have something which is known as the diffusion over potential. So diffusion over potential at one or both electrodes is due to the presence of concentration gradients in the vicinity of the electrode surface. If you remember the slides where I showed you the electric double layer formation, you know that there is a double layer formed and in that particular double layer, you will have a concentration gradient. There will be uh, because of the electrochemical reaction, the concentration at the electrode surface will no longer be in their equilibrium values. So if the migration through this electric double layer is very rapid, then diffusion from the bulk of the solution to the electrode will be unable to replenish the ions at the double layer quickly enough and so the concentration gradient will result. So because of this concentration gradient, we have, what we have is a diffusion over potential. There will be a slowing down. And that is why diffusion is kind of hindered and you have this diffusion over potential developing. So these are the three major causes for over potential developing in your particular uh, electrochemical uh, reaction apparatus. Now coming to our main topic, which we are starting today, which is batteries. So what is battery? Battery is definitely you all know is a device which is converting chemical energy directly to electrical energy. So battery will consist of one or more voltaic cells, the voltaic cells which I had discussed before. So each voltaic cell, it consists of two half cells which are connected in series by a conducting electrolyte. So there are typical dry cells and batteries which are shown over here in this particular figure you can see. So these primary type of cells, these cannot be recharged. So they are single use. So batteries voltage output and current rating, these are determined by elements which are using for the electrode the size of the electrode and the type of the electrolyte, whatever you are using. And depending on type cells, typically they will have a nominal, nominal potential, which will range anywhere between 1.2 volt to 3 volt. So there are a few points for the batteries, which I would like to tell you at this point. So whether a battery may be recharged or not, depends on the cells which is used to make up the battery. So whether you will have a single use battery or a rechargeable battery or not, it depends on the uh, type of cell or the material which you are using uh, to make up the battery. Primary cell, will be, which the one which cannot be recharged, the reason is the internal chemical reaction, it cannot be restored. So once it is, once the chemical reaction happens, you cannot reverse it back. So that is how your primary cell works. Whereas in a secondary cell or a storage cell, it can be recharged because the chemical reaction is reversible. So dry cells mostly have a moist electrolyte. We, we talk about this dry cell battery. So dry cells basically have a moist electrolyte, which is which cannot be spilled. And sealed rechargeable cells, these are secondary cells that contain the sealed electrolyte, which cannot be refilled. So there are different types of batteries. So among the different Primary cells, what we have is the carbon zinc dry cell. We have something which is known as alkaline cells. We have zinc chloride cells. We used to have mercury cells, but these are now more or less obsolete uh, because of the toxicity involved with mercury. And then you have the silver oxide cells. So only one type of cell I will discuss with you, which is the carbon zinc dry cell. In this case, as you can see, you have in this particular case, you have a carbon which is a positive electrode. You can see the cylinder kind of thing. This is the carbon positive electrode. You have an electrolyte paste which is somewhere here in the middle. Then you have a separator. Then you have carbon and manganese dioxide mixture and you have zinc. Zinc is basically over here on the outer side and this is the negative electrode or which is the anode. So you will find that there is a movement from the anode to the cathode and this reaction happens and it happens once and then the cell basically you have to throw away. It's a single use cell. The performance of this cell is better with intermittent operation. This carbon zinc dry cell. The other type of cell is the alkaline cell and you will find these different names of that D type, C type, AA type, triple A type, you know, then AAA type. So all these different types are nothing but the shape and size of these different cells. 
So it has the same 1.5 volt output as a carbon zinc cell, but they are much more longer lasting. So what in this in this case for the alkaline uh, cells, what you have is a zinc anode and a manganese dioxide cathode, and the electro electrolyte is alkaline. It is basically a potassium hydroxide electrolyte, and this works with high efficiency even on continuous use. This is because it has a very low internal resistance compared to the previous cell, which is the carbon zinc dry cell. For the zinc chloride cell. This is also known as a heavy duty type battery, the zinc chloride ones. It is a modified zinc carbon cell. Why it is modified? Because it has little chance of liquid leakage. The problem with the zinc carbon cell was the leakage problem which was there and this was kind of uh, rectified in the zinc chloride cells. In this case, the cell will consume water along with the chemically active material. So what happens? By the end of life, this particular cell, it gets dry. So that leakage problem is taken care of in a zinc chloride cell compared to the zinc carbon dry cell. Mercury cell, as I said, is kind of a little bit obsolete now, but the cell consists of a zinc anode and a mercury compound cathode and potassium or sodium hydroxide is used as an electrolyte. Silver oxide cells, this has a zinc anode, it has a silver oxide cathode as the name suggests and again potassium or sodium hydroxide as the electrolyte. It is, uh, the voltage is generally 1.5 volts, you'll find it in miniature button forms. And these particular cells find a lot of application in hearing aids, in cameras, in the small watches. So this, the cell which you use is basically the silver oxide cells. Then comes the workhorse, which is the lead acid wet cell. So this is a kind of a rechargeable cell. So this is a secondary cell. So this cell is widely applied and the positive electrode here is lead peroxide. The negative electrode is spongy lead metal. Electrolyte is sulfuric acid. Output is around 2.1 volts per cell and the cells these are typically used in series combination of three so you will generally get it as a 6 volt battery or a 12 volt battery. So the secondary battery these are the secondary batteries or the rechargeable batteries which were used in the vehicles and during the discharge what happens is lead and lead peroxide they react to the sulfuric acid and what you produce is lead sulfate and water. And when you are charging the battery, the reverse reaction is happening. So from lead sulfide and water, you end up having this. So the current rating of generally batteries is given in ampere hour units. So this rating is proportional to the physical size of this lead acid wet cell or the rechargeable cell. So one of the biggest advantage of lead acid wet cell that whether you know how much of the charge is left by is by measuring its specific gravity. So the state of discharge or how much charge the battery has left is checked by measuring the specific gravity of the electrolyte. Why? Because if I show you this reaction, you can see as it discharges, it produces water. And when the water is actually entering into the, this electrolyte or this sulfuric acid, what happens is your specific gravity changes. So by measuring the specific gravity, you know the state of charge or discharge in this particular lead acid rechargeable cell. So now coming to the other uh, kind of cell, we have a nickel cadmium cell. These are the rechargeable nickel cadmium cells. So uh, this type of cell, it delivers very high current. It can be recharged many times. It can, you can store it for a very long period of time. An application includes in portable power tools, in alarm systems, in portable radio and TV equipments. So uh, the reaction over here, you can see nickel hydroxide reacts with cadmium, giving you nickel hydroxide and cadmium uh, hydroxide. This happens during the discharge. Whereas when you're charging the battery, you this nickel hydroxide and the cadmium hydroxide, they react and they again give you back nickel hydroxide and cadmium. In this case, the electrolyte is potassium hydroxide. But the function of the electrolyte in this particular case is just to act as a conductor for the transfer of the hydroxyl ions. But the specific gravity, as you can see, it does not change with the state of charge for this particular rechargeable battery. Compared to nickel cadmium, a lot of uh, application and uh, usefulness is shown by nickel metal hydride cell. Why? The reason is definitely because of the toxicity which is associated with cadmium. So in nickel metal hydride, you are using the same kind of material only instead of cadmium, what you are using is a metal hydride. As I have written over here, contain the same components as nickel cadmium cell except for the negative electrode. So it is more expensive than the nickel cadmium cells. It self discharge more rapidly and cannot be cycled as frequently as nickel cadmium cells. But because of the less toxicity, this definitely is finding much more application currently. Now coming into one very important concept, which is series and parallel connected cells. I'm sure you remember, but still I will just refresh your memory. 
So an applied voltage higher than the voltage of one cell, it can be obtained when you are connecting your cells in series. So the total voltage available across the battery cells is equal to the sum of the individual values of each cell. In parallel cells, you will have the same voltage, but the current is again additive in this case. So in order to have a higher output voltage and a higher current, then you have to actually combine your cells in series and parallel. And the combination of these cells, these individual cells is nothing but a battery. So when you talk about a battery, basically it is all these individual cells which you are combining either in series or parallel or in combination of both. And then you get a specific output of voltage, a specific output of current, and that is known as a battery. So these are the different series and parallel connected cells. So instead of drawing it in this particular very cumbersome form, this is the notation which is used. I'm sure all of you know this notation. So you know which is the cathode, which is the anode and how the load is going to look. So this is the resistance and this is the voltage which is applied and what is the current which is going to flow. And this is based on the equation of V is equal to IR. So these uh, different slides you can just check. This is for refreshing your memory. I will not go into details of this. So this is the one thing which I would discuss. The current drain, it depends on the load resistance. So the actual amount of current which is produced when the battery is connected to a load resistance, as I said, is given by Ohm's law, where I is equal to V by R. So in this particular, you can see the voltage is 1.5 volt, but depending on the R value, the current it changes in this particular circuit. So current really will depend on the load which you are putting into the battery. So now coming to the workhorse of batteries, which is the lithium ion battery. So in 2019, the chemistry Nobel Prize was given to three very famous scientists, John B. Goodenough, M. Stanley Whittingham, Whittingham and Akira Yoshimi for the development of lithium ion batteries. And Nobel Foundation, uh, why they gave this particular Nobel Prize, this is what the Nobel Foundation had uh, kind of given in their uh, pamphlet. That this lightweight, rechargeable and powerful battery is now used in everything from mobile phones to laptops and electric vehicles. It can also store significant amount of energy from uh, solar uh, and wind power, making possible a fossil fuel free society. So this was uh, the, uh, the Nobel pamphlet in which uh, they had explained that why this particular uh, Nobel Prize was given to these three uh, path uh, work, which was done by these three scientists. So John B. Goodenough, M. Stanley Whittingham and Akira Yoshino. John B. Goodenough just passed away this year. Um, he got the Nobel when he was 97 years old and uh, he passed away just one month short of being uh, celebrating his 101st birthday. So uh, now let's look into how does this lithium ion battery actually work. So in a lithium ion battery what you have is this lithium ion is shuttled between a host which is you know the anode. You have the anode over here. And you have a cathode, which is high voltage or have a, has a low chemical potential and you have a separator. So what is happening is the lithium ion keeps shuttling between the anode and the cathode. And this is how it stores the energy. Please remember one thing, we always talk about lithium ion battery. Whereas when you talk about a lithium battery, the anode in this particular case is going to be a lithium metal. Whereas when we talk about lithium ion battery, the anode is nothing but graphite. So let's see the contribution of each of these three famous scientists who got the Nobel Prize. So the contribution of Stan Whittingham comes first because he was the first person and uh, this particular work, it appeared in Journal of Electrochemical Society in 1976. And here what he showed is that you take a lithium metal anode and the cathode is basically lithium titanium sulfide and you are able to actually shuttle the lithium ion between the cathode and the anode. So this was his work. So he emphasized the role of ternary phases in cathode reaction in these kind of cells. So the problem with this particular work was that it is based on the metallic lithium anode. Remember, this is the metallic lithium anode and this reacts with the electrolyte. Whatever electrolyte he had used, it reacted with it to instability and growth of lithium whisker dendrites. And if the whisker is growing, then what is going to happen is that it is going to perforate this, it's going to come and meet your cathode and at the end of the day, what is going to happen is a short circuit. 
So there is some kind of hotspot developing and the lithium just starts growing, just starts depositing continuously on this point and ultimately what you see is a short circuit. So that's why it didn't have a lot of cyclability. This work didn't have a lot of cyclability. So what was the contribution of John Goodenough? His work came in 1980 in Materials Research Bulletin and he actually found out that instead of using lithium titanium sulfide, if you use lithium cobalt oxide, and again he used the lithium metal anode, what he found is this is going to be a much better cathode material compared to that of lithium titanium sulfide. Why? A very simple chemistry concept he used. A larger negative free energy change for this reaction. If you want to have a larger negative free energy change for this particular reaction, then you need to have A, which is very small, and that's why it is lithium. M and X, it should contain a metal atom, M in a high oxidation state, which is cobalt, and X is small and electronegative, which is oxygen. So instead of sulfur, he changed it to oxygen, and this was a master stroke. Because even today in the commercial lithium ion batteries, the cathode material which is used is lithium cobalt oxide. And what was the contribution of Akira Yoshino? His contribution is immense because he was the first person who showed that instead of lithium metal anode, which was creating this entire problem of short circuit and you know uh, un um, unstable cycles, that graphite can be used as anode and in between the graph graphene layers actually this lithium it can get intercalated. So replacing the anode with highly graphitic carbon that intercalates lithium between the layers, it obviates the dendrite growth. So it obviates the, sh the short circuiting uh, potential of these particular lithium ion batteries. So ultimately by the contribution of all these three scientists in 1991, lithium ion battery was commercialized by Sony and Asahi Kasai Corporation with Samsung SDI beginning the manufacture of lithium ion batteries at their Korea plant in the year 2000. So that starts from there onwards, it starts the entire world of portable electronics, which we now simply cannot live without, live without. So what happens in a lithium ion battery cell? Let's look into it. I have discussed in parts. Now let's look into it. How actually a lithium ion battery cell is going to look. In the cathode, you can see you have lithium cobalt oxide. And the anode side, what you have is basically a carbon. And now it is graphite. So during discharge, what is happening? Discharge, basically, whatever lithium is stored in the graphite is actually moving back into the cathode. When you're charging, you're pushing the lithium from the LiCO2, you're taking in part of this lithium and you are pushing it into the anode and it gets stored in that layers. It is intercalated in between the carbon layers. You have an electrolyte, which is generally a, a kind of a carbonate solution, which you are having, and you have a lithium salt, which is generally LiPF6 or LiClO4. You are using these two kinds of salt and this is what is used as the electrolyte and you have a separator. So this is the schematic representation of a lithium ion battery cell. Now coming to a very important thing, as I told you, we have two very important concepts. One is energy density and the other is power density. So what you have is that this, there's a plot which is known as the Ragone plot. So this plot is used to compare the energy density of various energy storing devices. There are many different energy storing devices. As you can see, you have fuel cell, as I have discussed, lead acid battery, you have nickel cadmium battery, you have lithium battery. And then you also, we'll also be discussing about capacitors. So we have ultra capacitors, we have aluminum electrolyte capacitor. So all these have different kinds of energy density and power density. So this Ragon plot is generally used to compare the energy density of these various energy storing devices. So on this chart, what you have is the value of the specific energy density, which is watt hour uh, per kg. And you have the power density, which is watt per kg. So on the y axis, it is energy density. On the x axis, it is power density. And this vertical axis, it describes how much of energy is available per unit mass. So this particular y axis is telling you how much of energy is available per unit mass while the horizontal axis is telling you how quickly you can deliver that particular energy. So a point in the Ragone plot, please remember this thing, a point in the Ragone plot, it represents a particular energy device or technology. So if I say lithium battery, so basically lithium battery is sitting here. So this is the energy density corresponding to it. And this is the power density corresponding to that. 
Whereas if you look into ultra capacitors, you can see that power density is here, whereas the energy density is here. So from here, it's very clear that lithium battery is having very high energy density, power density is not that much. Whereas capacitors, they have a much lower energy density compared to batteries, but their power density is very, very high. So that is if you need low, uh, in very short time, if you require a lot of energy to be delivered or discharged, then you have to go for capacitor kind of application. Whereas if you need to store a large amount of energy, then it is battery kind of applications. So the amount of time in hours during which a device can be operated at its rated power, this is the ratio between the specific energy and the specific power. So Y by X is giving you nothing but the amount of time in hours during which a device can be operated. So if you, uh, these ISO curves or the constant operating time in the Ragon plot, these are generally straight lines because of this, because this Y by X value is giving you the ratio of specific energy to specific power. And this gives you the time scale. So what is voltage of a battery? I was talking so much about voltage, 1.5 volt. Risk. So cell voltage is determined by the compatibility of the whole system. So it includes anode, cathode, anode, electrolyte. So it's a difference between the chemical potential between the anode and the cathode. And uh, so this VOC, as you know, is the open circuit voltage. It is giving you, it's the difference between the chemical potential of the anode minus the, can, can, uh, the chemical potential of the cathode and divided by the magnitude of the electronic charge. So the difference in Gibbs free energy, which is the reaction between a charge stage and a discharge state, this is described by this particular equation, delta G is equal to delta H R minus T delta S R. And again, if you replace delta H R by delta U and P delta V, then you have this particular expression. And from here, delta V, if you look into the delta V and this delta S R, which corresponds to the volume change and the change in the vibrational and configuration entropies of ion insertion or extraction, these are very negligible. These are of the order of 10 to the power minus 5 and 10 to the power minus 2 EV. So this is extremely negligible. And delta UR is nothing but change in internal energy. So which is almost like 2 to 3 electron volts. So this evaluates your delta G in the reaction. So the chemical potential ultimately is correlated with the partial molar quantity of Gibbs free energy. And this equilibrium voltage you can obtain by this particular equation where EX is nothing but minus delta G by XJ minus XI into Faraday constant. So these are XJ and XI is nothing but the solid solubility limits of your intercalation reaction. Where is this intercalation happening in case of the anode? So an intercalation reaction, the difference between the solubility limit multiplied by the Faraday uh, constant and uh, this into your, uh, uh, this uh, when the delta G is divided by this particular value, what you get is nothing but the voltage. So now we come to another very important concept that, okay, what determines, you know, what determines this uh, voltage? So this voltage basically is limited by the electrochemical window of the electrolyte. Or as I can say, now I can keep on increasing the chemical potential of my anode. I can keep on decreasing the chemical potential of my cathode. And then the voltage is just going to increase indefinitely. But that doesn't happen. So theoretically, it can occur in pen and paper, but it will not happen when you're doing the reaction. And the reason is because your this is limited by the voltage window, which is provided by your electrolyte. So the anode and cathode, it has to be selected in such a way that the mu A, that is the chemical potential of your anode, should lie below the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the electrolyte, uh, the or electrolyte which you're using. Whereas the cathode potential or chemical potential should be higher than that of the highest occupied molecular orbital. And if it is not following this particular limitation, then what is going to happen is that there's going to be a decomposition of your electrolyte. So if the decomposition of the electrolyte is taking place, in that case, what you are going to have, uh, what is going to happen is you are going to lead to the formation of a, a, a film or this SEI film, which we call it. And this SEI film formation will occur on the surface of the anode. So is the formation of this SEI film all negative? No, it has some advantages also. So these advantages I have written in green. So what are these different advantages? When you have this SEI film, what happens it, it permits the diffusion of the lithium ions through the film under a uniform electric field and it reduces the over potential and the concentration polarization. So it is actually advantageous to have SEI. It also prevents the aggregation of electrochemically active particles 
and maintains a uniform chemical composition at the electrodes. And SCI can also effectively prevent the exfoliation of graphite during the insertion and extra extraction of the lithium ions. So putting it in a nutshell, what it is doing, you have your anode surface. On your anode surface, some kind of electrolyte decomposition is taking place and you are having this protective film getting formed. And this protective film, if it is formed, it helps because it will allow the diffusion of your lithium ions. It is also going to prevent aggregation of these lithium ions in one particular place. And it is also going to prevent further deterioration of your anode. But what happens is because that film is formed, you have the internal resistance of the battery increasing. And of course, due to the formation of the SCI, in the process of the formation of the SCI, some amount of the lithium ion is getting you know, consumed. And so ultimately what is going to happen? Your cathode is LiCO2. From that, some amount of lithium is getting wasted in forming this SCI. And that lithium is no longer able to shuttle in because now it is kind of formed an irreversible reaction because of the formation of the SCI. So the lithium is not shuttling back, back and forth. So ultimately you lose that lithium. So that means it leads to both power loss as well as capacity loss. So that is why SEI formation has both its pros and cons. Now, when we come to electrolyte materials, electrode materials, there's another very important concept you will find in different papers, which is known as the theoretical capacity of the electrode material. So when you're taking an electrode material, it has a particular capacity. How do you get that capacity value? So it is given by NF by 3.6 into N. What is N? N is the number of reactive electrons per formula unit. For a lithium ion battery concept, it is number of lithium ions which is getting transported during the charge discharge process. F is nothing but your Faraday constant and M is the, mole, mo, uh, the molecular weight of your material. So smaller the molecular weight and larger the value of N this will give you give rise to a higher capacity. And when we talk about the energy density, this energy density is nothing but a product of specific capacity and the working voltage of your battery. So if the specific capacity is high, you get a higher energy density. If the working voltage is high, you again get a higher energy density. So these are the two factors, very important factors, which all the researchers work on to improve the energy density of a battery. So then now comes the designing part. So this is a materials chemistry course. So we'll talk about materials a lot. So now we'll talk about the electrode materials, which are uh, which are available for design of all these new electrodes. So uh, the, my first statement is the lighter elements are favored. Why? Because as I said, as I showed to you in this previous year, lighter elements means this M value. So if M value is low, then your this value increases. If this increases, that means your specific capacity increases, which means your energy density increases. So what we have over here is lighter elements are favored because they will give you more high specific capacity. And these are generally in the first four periods of the periodic table. Then another very important thing is you are using transition metal oxides. As I told you, LiCO2, the transition metal in this case is cobalt. These are these are used as cathode materials. Why? Because they have a variable valence state. And definitely with a variable valence state, they will have facilitate much more electron storing sites. Then again, electronegativity and ionization energies also determine the type of bond which is formed between the transition metal and the ligands, or in this case, particular case was oxide. And that will again tell you, you know, how, uh, what is the kind of voltage you will develop in the particular material. So normally, when we are looking for elements, we look for natural abundance, uh, abundance. Then we look for lack of competition with other industrial applications, eco-friendly, and it should be low cost. So this is from the industry point of view. Technologically, the electrode materials must offer a very large reversible storage capacity at a desired electrochemical potential. So remember, metal lithium anode, it has a theoretical capacity of 3850 milliampere hour per gram. This you can calculate very easily using the, uh, the formula which I had given in the previous slide. And silicon has a value of around 4200 milliampere hour per gram. If it, is, if it is forming an alloy with lithium and the kind of alloy it is forming is Li22Si4. So in this particular case, pertaining to formation of this particular alloy, this is going to be the theoretical capacity. So what are the different factors which affect the electrochemical potential? Because that is what is going to give you the working voltage. One is electronegativity. Why? 
what is electronegativity first? It is the tendency of atom or a functional group to attract electrons or the electron density towards itself. So if there is a larger difference, very large difference in electronegativity, so it will lead to the formation of ionic bond. And if the difference is very low, then we know it forms a covalent bond. So one thing which we all know is if you have an ionic bond, it will lead to form formation of very dense structures. So if it's a structure is very dense in that case, this will affect the crystal and the phase stability of the materials. And it also will affect the specific site energy of lithium ions. And this is correlated with the electrochemical potential of the materials. So that is the reason why electronegativity plays a role in electrochemical potential of your electrode materials. So another very important thing, you will find as I'm moving over here, I, on the y-axis you're finding potential and on the x-axis you'll find different d, d uh, electrons are there. For the different transition metal ions, you know that the d orbitals are occupied and you have different number of d electrons. So one very uh, good thing about it is you can see that as the number of d electrons increases, what is happening is for the same material you'll find that the potential it increases. So the more energy is released when electrons are inserted into orbitals or more energy is consumed when electrons are promoted from the orbitals. So what happens is you have a higher electrochemical potential for the electrode materials. So why this thing, why this dependence with the D electrons? So if you have more amount of D electrons, what is happening? The thing is that the outer electrons are getting much more attracted towards because the nuclear charge is increasing, whereas the screening is very poor. So the outermost electrons are getting massively attracted towards the uh, to, uh, to, uh, towards the nucleus. So at the end of the day, what is happening is then pulling of the electrons from this particular um, elements, it becomes very difficult. And if that becomes difficult, then more energy is going to be released when the electrons are inserted into the orbitals or more energy is going to be consumed when electrons are promoted. And that is why the electrochemical potential of these electrode materials increases as and, as and when you have more amount of D electrons. Then another factor is the average potential here we what we have plotted is basically the average potential in phosphate type of materials when you have phosphate type of cathodes in that case what is the maximum gravimetric capacity which is available how we will do that so here you just look into this particular figure here you have all the bismuth compounds and here you are having all the molybdenum compounds why is it so the bismuth phosphate and molybdenum phosphate so you look into the potential the specific capacity is more in case of the gravimetric or the specific capacity is more in case of molybdenum. It is less in case of bismuth. Whereas in uh, the potential basically is more in case of bismuth and less in case of molybdenum. Why is it so? Because bismuth belongs to periodic period six as well as group five of the periodic table. It has a very large atomic number and large electronegativity. So it has a very high electrochemical potential, but a smaller gravimetric capacity compared to that of molybdenum because molybdenum is having low electronegativity and relatively small atomic weight. So you have, when you are designing of an electrode material, you have to keep all these different things or different factors in your mind. Then there is another very uh, important factor which affects the electrochemical potential. It is basically the electronegativity. Electronegativity of what? Electronegativity of your polyanionic groups. So you have different kind of cathode materials, which are phosphates, it can be molybdates, it can be sulfates. So the electronegativity of these polyanionic groups, they actually affect the electrochemical potential. So the potential, it increases with increasing electronegativity of the polyanionic group. So what happens is you can see over here, if you're having a phosphate and you're having a sulfate, you can see compared to the phosphate, the sulfate is having a little high potential. This is because the sulfate has a little higher electronegativity compared to that of phosphate. Whereas molybdates have much lower, uh, this, uh, 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 they have lower electronegativity compared to that of the sulfates. So electronegativity also helps in pulling up or putting down the electrochemical potential of the electrodes. So, in the nutshell, when we are looking into designing of electrode materials for cathode for the lithium ion battery, we have to select elements where atomic weight, abundance, environmental impact and cost are to be considered. And then you have to consider the electronegativity of the element and the counter anion. And that is going to give you the electrochemical potential of the electrode material. So ultimately, because we are looking into the holy grail of having a highest energy density, so the two factors which are there, one is specific capacity and the other is your 
voltage. So now let's look into how the rechargeable lithium batteries came into being. As I said that Whittingham demonstrated the first lithium rechargeable lithium battery when he was working at Exxon Corporation in United States. And for, for that, he had used a TIS2 cathode, a lithium metal anode, and a liquid electrolyte in which a lithium salt, which was lithium chlorate, was dissolved in an organic solvent, which was dimethoxyethane and tetrahydrofurane. What was the problem? The cell voltage was very much limited. It was less than 2.5 volt. So this limited the energy density. And of course, there was dendrite growth on lithium metal anodes, which I had already explained before. So how the genesis of the oxide cathodes came in? Cell voltage, as I told you, is determined by the energy difference between the redox energies of the anode and the cathode. So cathode energy should lie as low as possible and the anode energy should be as high as possible. So that means what? The cathode would require stabilization of higher oxidation state with a lower lying energy band. An anode would require stabilization of lower oxidation state with a very high energy band. So now how do you access this? And this is the problem which actually John B. Goodenough, Professor John B. Goodenough solved. And he had a very indigenous technique what he used. So you have lithium and lithium metal, the potential is here. And what he observed is that if you are taking sulfides, in that particular case, the top of this sulfide 3P band the, is lying at a higher energy limit and, the, and this limits the cell voltage. You see the cell voltage over here, it becomes only 2.5 volt against lithium. And you are using, and he, the titanium sulfide was used. Obviously, you cannot have something below sulfide because if you are using any of these redox uh, things which are below that of sulfide 2 plus 2 minus layer, in that case, what is going to happen is, uh, it is going to oxidize the sulfide ions and you will ultimately end up with a molecular disulfide ion. So it is going to kind of decompose your cathode material. So this is where John B. Goodenough thought that instead of using sulfide, if you go into oxides, then you are able to go up to cobalt kind of materials, cobalt 3 plus, 4 plus, redox also you can achieve. And with the oxide, then this voltage difference, instead of 2.5 voltage, goes way up to 4 volts. So that is the way you can improve the voltage and you can improve the energy density. So that is why instead of TIS2, the thing which came into being was LiCO2. So there are three different class of oxide cathodes which was developed way back in the 1980s. So these three different class of oxide cathodes and all this work happened in two laboratories. One is University of Texas Austin and the other was in Oxford. So you had the layered LiCO2 then you had the spinel LiMn2O4 and you had the spinel LiMn2O4 and you had the polyanion which is basically nothing but sulfates or molybdates or tungstates. So these were the different and these were using iron. So you have LiFe sulfates that are iron sulfates, iron molybdates or iron tungstates. So layered TiO2 it has an octahedral side lithium ions and this offered an increase in the cell voltage from less than 2.5 volt in case of titanium sulfide to 4 volt. Spinel LiMn2O4, it has tetrahedral site lithium ions and it offers an increase in cell voltage from 3 volt for the octahedral site lithium ions with manganese 3 plus 4 plus coupled to almost 4 volt. And this accompanying with a cost reduction because you are not using uh, which uh, expensive cobalt. Cobalt is also a little bit uh, more expensive compared to you know the other uh, transition metals which we have. Then polyanion oxide, it offered yet another way of increasing the cell voltage through the inductive effect. And from less than 2.5 volt, uh, you can go up to more than 3.6 volt. So this and this with a further reduction in cost and improved thermal stability and safety. Here also you are using earth abandoned iron instead of cobalt. So class cathode class 1, let's discuss a little bit about the layered cathodes. The structure you have to understand. In layered lithium cobalt oxide, what do you have? You have basically monovalent lithium, this is here, and you have this trivalent uh, cobalt ions, which are ordered in the alternate 111 planes of the rock salt structure. And we have a cubic close packed array of your uh, this oxide ions. And this structure is known as the O3 structure. So what happens in this case, there is a large charge and size difference between the lithium plus and the CO3 plus. 
and so it leads to a very good cation ordering and this is very critical to support the fast two dimensional lithium ion diffusion and conductivity in the lithium plane so what happens is over here you have a direct cobalt cobalt interaction why because you have a very sh a shared octahedral edge over here in the cobalt plane and this facilitates very good electronic conductivity so uh, the problem is of course what happens is LiCO2 it becomes metallic on charging because what you are doing is when you are taking out the lithium what happens you are introducing holes into the low spin CO3 plus 4 plus that is T2G6 minus X band and so it becomes a little bit metallic but there is a good structural stability along with high electrical and lithium ion conductivity so it offers very fast charge discharge characteristics with very good reversibility. So as of today, LiCO2 remains one of the best cathodes with a very high operating voltage of 4 volt. But there is a problem. The practical capacity of the lithium cobalt oxide is limited to 140 milliampere hour per gram. Actually, if you look into the theoretical capacity, if you are able to extract out the entire lithium, it should go more than 273. But the practical capacity is only this much because the moment you start removing the lithium, then this problem starts happening you introduce holes into the system and with that hole what happens is after some time the you have an if you draw out more amount of lithium then an oxygen evolution takes place and that destabilizes the cathode. So now when we talk about LiMO2 oxides there are it this O3 layered structure of LiCO2 if you look into LiMO2 which are the ones which has this O3 layered structure so here I have given titanium has it vanadium has it chromium has it and of course you have cobalt which you are anyway using and nickel has it so there are five choices but why you have taken only why only cobalt is taken because lithium titanate it operates at a much lower voltage and it's very difficult to synthesize then LiCRO2 it is very difficult to charge at displays of any displays of very high polarization with an increase in the charge voltage and LiNiO2 is difficult to synthesize as a well-ordered material and then there is a problem in LiCO2 you have CO3 plus which is quite stable but Ni3 plus now it has a tendency to get reduced to Ni2 plus so what you ultimately end up is with Li1 minus Y Ni 1 plus Y O2 at high temperature synthesis conditions at 700 to 800 degrees centigrade there's a temperature you need to synthesize a lot of volatilization of lithium takes place. Now the other members of the series this vanadium, manganese, iron they have another problem instead of this layered structure what happens is the moment uh, you start extracting lithium out of the structure they will give rise to formation of the spinel transition because they have a very low octahedral side stabilization energy so these cannot be good cathodes the moment you have a structural transition happening then a lot of other factors again come in which is very it's not very good to have those kind of cathode materials they're not very healthy cathodes because and if you are having this kind of phase transition happening from layer to a spinel structure so because that co factor is there that it is expensive and cobalt mines are not many and it's distributed in very you know isolated pockets in the world so cobalt is a very expensive material so obviously the idea has been to how to reduce the cost of lithium ion batteries and this is where different cathode materials have been developed and out of this the NMC cathode which is basically a part of the cobalt you are removing and you are adding a little bit of nickel and manganese both of which are a little bit earth abandoned abundant and so if you are using those kind of uh, metals instead of elements instead of cobalt that is going to bring down the cost. So that was basically the genesis of this NMC type of cathode. So when you reduce cobalt content, you bring down the cost and you improve the capacity. How you improve the capacity? So in NMC, what is happening? MN3 plus, you are having MN in the form of MN3 plus. So it has a tendency to get oxidized. It gets oxidized during synthesis to form MN4 plus. And how does it do it? By reducing Ni3 plus to Ni2 plus. And so what happens is MN4 plus will help in the incorporation of the nickel as a stable Ni2 plus into NMC and thus it serves as a structural stabilizer without participating in the charge discharge process. So the sole purpose of having manganese is to stabilize this nickel because as I told you LiNiO2 it's very difficult because of the structural instability because Ni3 plus will always have a tendency to form Ni2 plus. 
So manganese does not suffer from any chemical instability involving oxygen release from the lattice in contrast to cobalt as the cobalt 3 plus and 4 plus band overlaps with the top of the this band. So if this sentence is not making any sense, let me go back to this particular figure. As you can see over here, so there because of this overlap what is happening, you can see this overlap, this overlap region here. So there is an oxygen evolution. Whereas when you're taking manganese, these are highly distant from each other and this oxygen evolution doesn't take place. So this is the meaning of this particular sentence. So now manganese suffers from structural instability, of course. Why? Because it can readily migrate. So manganese, it doesn't suffer from chemical instability, but it suffers from structural instability. Why? Because it readily migrates from the octahedral sites in the transition metal plane to the octahedral sites, uh, the octahedral sites in the lithium plane to a neighboring tetrahedral site. And this is due to the very low octahedral site stabilization energy. And so this layer, uh, this results in a layer from a layered structure, it goes to the spinel structure. And so obviously you have an accompanying voltage decay during cycling. So among these three, so now you see what is happening. Chemical stability is highest for manganese. Structural stability is highest for cobalt. Electrical conductivity is best for cobalt. Abundance is good for manganese and environmental benignity, of course, that is high for manganese. So each of them has a positive and a little bit of negative point and mixing all those three ultimately gives rise to a very symbiotic, nice cathode. So nickel, as you can see here, all these different parameters, chemical stability, structural stability, electrical conductivity, abundance and environmental benignity, nickel is in the midpoint of manganese and cobalt. So nickel 3 plus 4 plus it band, it barely touches the top of this oxide 2p band. So nickel 3 plus can be charged all the way to nickel 4 plus without removal of energy density from the oxygen 2p band. And so there is no loss of oxygen from the lattice. And nickel 3 plus exhibits an octahedral site uh, stabilization energy value which is intermediate between those of manganese 3 plus and cobalt 3 plus. And so it offers a reasonably good structural stability. So currently the trend or the research is mostly focused on nickel rich and MC cathodes because manganese if you use manganese uh, the, 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 pro the problem with manganese is of course it has the, the structural stability it moves from layer to uh, spinal structure and so it brings down a, a decay in the capacity and decay in the voltage. So that is why what we prefer is having more amount of nickel so that eats away you know into the cobalt. And so the cost goes gets down and manganese kind of stabilizes it. As I told you, the problems associated with LiNiO2, we cannot have completely NiO2. So we can only go for a nickel rich kind of a cathode. So this, all these portion, uh, the, the points which are given in this slide, I have already discussed. So I will just skip this. So now what you have is the, which are the, what are the problems which are associated with LiNO2? One of the major problem is the highly oxidized and unstable Ni4+, it can also cause thermal runaway. So at the end of the day, the thing is that what we are looking in, what the researchers are kind of looking in currently in cathodes for lithium ion batteries are NMC cathodes where you are having more and more amount of nickel. So currently a lot of research is being done on 811 configuration which is you have 80% of nickel and you have only 10% of manganese and 10% of cobalt. So layered oxides with high nickel contents, so they have three critical challenges, cycle instability, thermal instability and air instability. And all these three factors are kindly getting worked upon and we are trying to find out, all the researchers in the world over the world are trying to find out how you can balance all these different three critical challenges which is posed by the NMC cathodes. So after a specific number of cycles what happens the SEI layer thickness will start increasing and if you keep on increasing the SEI layer thickness after a certain time lot of transition metal dissolution will take place and if that it is going to deposit it's going to go and deposit on the graphite anode. So if this happens in that particular case there is a poisoning of the anode which takes place and then your cell stops functioning. So these are the different problems which are associated with NMC cathodes and each of these problems are getting rectified upon by different research groups all over the world.
So one of the way which has been found out, one of the way which has been, it has been now established that you can actually make the NMC cathodes work better is by doing some kind of bulk cation doping or else you can do some surface stabilization. So you can use some surface stabilization strategies to minimize the volume changes or the crack formation and the surface reactivity can help to overcome these challenges. Or else you can substitute the transition metal ions with a small amount of inert ion like aluminium. So this will make your lattice very robust. Why? Because it will perturb the long range metal metal interaction and it will also increase the metal oxygen bond strength and so it will suppress the metal ion dissolution. So aluminium is a very good choice. So aluminium, this NMCA cathodes particularly are finding a lot of application now in different uh, commercial lithium ion batteries. In the spinel oxides, of course, we have LiMn2O4 and you have over here Mn3 plus and 4 plus which occupy the octahedral sites. Lithium ions, they occupy the tetrahedral sites and the spinel structure we all have studied. So the stable, this Mn2O4 framework with the edge shared octahedra, they offer a three dimensional lithium ion diffusion pathway. So remember for the layered structure, what we had was a two dimensional pathway. Whereas in case of a spinel oxide, what you have is a 3D pathway. So the ins insertion and extraction of lithium into uh, and from the tetrahedral site with a deep site energy in this LiMn2O4, they offer a higher operating voltage of 4 volt and here the practical capacity is around 130 milliampere hour per gram. So you have a, the practical capacity is almost similar to that of LiCO2 which was around 140 and but in this case instead of using the expensive cobalt you are using much more friendly and earth abundant uh, manganese. So you have LiMn2O4. So as over here the, the statement which I made earlier, so here you have a two dimensional movement of the lithium diffusion whereas here it is a three dimensional movement. So in case of the spinners you have a 3D lithium diffusion from one tetrahedral site to the other tetrahedral site through a neighboring empty octahedral site in the spinner structure. So what are the problems? Again it is not without problem then we would have kind of uh, not used lithium cobalt oxide at all and we would have gone into spinel oxides. So what are the problems? Problem is the one which is giving you the solution that is manganese. So dissolution of manganese from the lattice into the electrolyte, it happens in the presence of trace amounts of acid in the electrolyte. And so there is a well known disproportionation reaction which takes place. So Mn3 plus it disproportionates into Mn4 plus and Mn2 plus. So Mn4 plus remains as a solid but the Mn2 plus it gets leached out. So if it gets leached out it migrates to the anode and then it poisons the graphite anode and it limits the cycle life of the lithium ion cells. So now how do you circumvent this? If you add little amount of lithium instead of manganese if you are doping it with a little more amount of lithium in that case what happens it perturbs this long range manganese manganese interaction and it frustrates this manganese 3 plus disproportionation reaction and it reduces the manganese dissolution and it improves the cyclability. So this is the way you can take care of this manganese dissolution problem. So what are these different uh, 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 different transition metal ions which crystallize in the spinner structure? So we have manganese which we are anyway working on and apart from this it's only titanium. And what is the problem with titanium? This lithium titanate it operates only around 1.5 volt. So the energy density is going to be very low. And whereas lithium vanadate also, it also has a spinel structure. But the problem is that it suffers a lot from structural changes and it also has a much lower voltage. In manganate it is uh, uh, LiMn2O4 it is 4 volt whereas in case of B2O4 it is around 3 volt. Then the last class of cathodes is the polyanion oxides and here it is all about the electronegativity and basically the, the inductive effect which this sulfate ion is going to have. Uh, on the oxide that is if you are having instead of Fe2O3 what you are having in this case is a molybdate or a tungstate or a sulfate. So the major point in this particular thing is this that the redox energy of the Fe2 plus and 3 plus couple is altered um, uh, is kind of altered because it is drastically shifting the redox energy the, the, the presence of this MO6 plus or tungsten 6 plus or sulfide 6 plus is drastically shifting the redox energy of the Fe2 plus and 3 plus couple by altering the characteristics of this FeO bond. So 
what you are having is you are having this fe2 xo43 structure what is this x x is molybdenum tungstate or sulfur and in this feo6 octahedra you shared the the, the feo6 octahedra is sharing its corners with the xo4 tetrahedra that is molybdate or tungstate or sulfate tetrahedra and it provides an extended three dimensional o feo x o feo x linkage so what is happening if you are having a more covalent moo bond or this xo bond it will weaken your feo bond so if it weakens the feo bond then there is going to be covalency through the inductive effect and obviously because of this what is going to happen is there is going to be a lowering of the fe3 plus 2 plus redox energy and as a consequence there is going to be an increase in the operating voltage so this is whatever i said very clear pictorially over here you can see for fe2 o3 this redox potential lies here, so it's around 2.5 volt. Whereas when you move to sulfate, there is an increase in this voltage, so it moves up to around 3.6 volt, and automatically there is a lot of improvement in the energy density when you are using this kind of polyanion oxides as the cathode. Same thing is given pictorially. You can pictorially, you can later on you can look into this particular slide. So now there is one more cathode from this polyanion uh, kind of uh, cathodes which is being commercialized which is LiFePO4 so instead of LiCO2 you also have LiFePO4 which is being used as cathode since 1997 so this has the ability to increase the voltage drastically to as high as 5 volts and in this particular case it has been identified that LiFePO4 is a very good cathode and you can have other cathode materials also phosphate cathodes which are Li3V2PO4 thrice or you can have sodium vanadium phosphate or you can have sodium vanadium fluorophosphate which has also become very good cathodes for lithium ion battery as well as for next generation battery alkali ion batteries which are sodium ion batteries. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of these oxide cathodes let's see. So layered and spinel oxides they all have good electronic conductivity. They have a close pack structure with very high density. They have very high volumetric density. So these are all the plus points for layered and spinel oxide cathodes. So out of the three cathode materials, two of them have all these good points. Whereas polyanion oxides, they suffer. They have poor electronic conductivity. They have lower density. They have lower volumetric density. But still they are being considered. Why? Because one very important factor or advantage for a polyanion class of cathodes is that they have very high thermal stability. And they have much better safety compared to the layered and spinel oxide cathodes because the oxygen in, in case of a polyanion oxide is tightly bound to the phosphorus, sulfur or silicon with very strong covalent bonds. Also, if you are having a polyanion cathode which is coated with carbon, it can sustain high charge and discharge rate due to good structural integrity despite of having a lower volumetric energy density. And polyanion cathodes they are made up of abundant transition metals like iron, unlike the layered and spinel oxides offering sustainability advantages. Therefore, they are appealing for grid storage of electricity produced from renewable energy sources like solar and wind. So, in a nutshell, what we can see is when we looked into the cathode materials, we have three different kinds of cathodes. The layered cathodes LiCO2 which is still being used in all portable electron by, uh, electronics because of the very high energy density which is offered by LiCO2. Whereas when we move to a polyanionic oxide type of cathode material in this particular case the advantage is that though it will give you a little less energy density but the safety features are very high. The safety features are very high and uh, because you can actually uh, have a little low gravimetric capacity or energy density compared to that of LiCO2, you can use this in case of battery applications where size is not a factor, energy density doesn't become such a great factor. So when you're having renewable energy like solar and wind and you need to store it when uh, you have excess amount and you're not putting it into the grid, you want to store it. So instead of using precious cobalt as the cathode in that particular case you can use this LiFePO4 as a cathode material because it is using earth abundant materials like iron. So this is basically the idea. So now with this I will I think end this particular lecture. So if you have any questions you can connect with me.
so in case you have any doubts and uh, you have any queries you can always email me my email address is given so for any particular question you can always pose the question and go through the lecture once again and as and when you get, get any doubts you can please email me so with that i think we will close this particular lecture session good evening to all of you